Welcome to the Ayn Rand Fan Club. I'm Scott Shoup along with William Swig. William, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Good, good. Well, we are glad to have Dave Goodman uh, back for his third visit to the clubhouse. Dave, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. I thought your commentary would be especially useful. Uh, you know, we're talking today about the political evolution of Leonard Peikoff. Uh, over the last 20 years or so. And, uh, I, you know, I just wanted to say why this is such an important topic to me personally. I mean, I decided that the left was a bigger threat probably about the time of Monica Lewinsky. Uh, I was in a Kansas City objectivist group in, in 2004 when, you know, word of Peikoff's full-throated backing of Kerry came up. Uh, some people in the group said it was based on his dim hypothesis. I mean, I, I basically left the movement for about 10 years uh, after we moved back to Florida after that. So it just, it means so much that he's come around or at least clarified how he sees the threat. And so we wanted to kind of document it and go through and, and discuss the issues. Uh, William, I think uh, you kind of were following more closely uh, when his dim hypothesis came out. Yes. Yeah, so in 2004, I was actually lucky enough to attend the course uh, that Dr. Peikoff gave on his new theory, his dim theory, which uh, the letters DIM stand for disintegration, integration, and misintegration. And he considers these separate modes for how cultures change. And he tries to apply them to various movements within a culture and types of governments. So he came up with this idea of history and it was, you know, all the rage in the early 2000s and, um, and beyond. And they started applying it to the elections. So one thing that Peikoff said in 2004 during one of these courses was that he endorsed John Kerry over Bush. And he didn't just endorse Kerry, he applied it to his dim theory and said that Bush was an M2, a misintegrated two, which means he's like an advocate of totalitarianism is how he put it on his website. So he's basically calling Bush an advocate of totalitarianism, which in hindsight, I'm not sure that makes sense. Um, it, yeah, his political allies at the time, like me, wish he were that tough. <laughs> yeah, it's it's rather hyperbolic, in my opinion, in hindsight. Although at the time, I kind of fell into this idea of the theory. A lot of people started adopting this this theory and and applying it to the politics, and and we all kind of thought, yeah, there's all this religious stuff going on. Like in the course, Peikoff mentions. Mel Gibson's movie Passion of the Christ and if you remember it was like the number one movie and like right. all kinds of people went to see it and objectivists on Cargate wrote an article about it and then uh, uh, Peikoff also showed that the left behind novels were very popular like they sold double what Ayn Rand has sold um, and he went through this list of how all these facts showing that religion was on the rise so he was very concerned about a theocracy and he called um, John Kerry normal bad. And then he called Bush apocalyptic bad. So I don't know, you, we, ha we have this thing Trump derangement syndrome now, but if we had a, had it back then, we might've said that Peikoff had Bush derangement syndrome. Uh, it was really quite extreme. His, his argument against Bush um, Went, was so extreme that he he thought that Bush was an advocate of a Puritan theocracy. That's a quote. So I don't know if you can really prove that Bush was a theocrat, um, but that's what Peikoff thought at the time. So, you know, what I remember that election and in 2006, that was still his general sentiment that he wanted the Republicans to be punished for their religious views. And um, then I remember by 2008, he made a comment that he was not going to support anyone in the election, uh, that he couldn't support either. 
But then sometime after the election of Obama, he seemed to realize that uh, Obama was worse. And, and I think that played a role in objectivist uh, joining with the Tea Party around 2009, 2010. Yeah. Uh, well, I just wanted to, we're moving real fast. Here. I just wanted to get Dave's opinion. Uh, what what did were you around in 2004 and did you you know follow the the dim theory you know i was 14 at the time but yeah no (laughs) i i listen um uh yeah yeah i I watched were you at the clip um let's see i guess the talk with david harriman that he posted on youtube is that the dim talk you went to um I don't think it was with Dave Harriman. It, it was a solo course that Peacock was giving. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it's, but it's kind know... of vague in my memory. I don't remember if he had guests join him or not. Because he only has one video about Dim uh, on YouTube, and it was with Harriman uh, and taking Q&A. Oh, no, no. This is the actual course. It's um, You probably have to pay for it. Uh, okay. But there, but there is a 19-minute clip that has been lost to the internet, and I had to dig it up from the Wayback Machine. Um, and that, in that clip, he gives his prediction for the election. I mean, I, I well, he has changed a lot since, uh, you know, because now he never. I mean, Peacock now never talks about Christianity. You know, at least his more recent clips, you know, back then, yeah, he has this, you know, I think too theoretical ivory tower view that it's going to be some kind of Christianity that that uh, initiates uh, our destruction. And I think he's moved away from that. But um, yeah, what were you going to say, Scott? I think that he was right about a coming theocracy, but just mistaken about it being Christianity. And that I came to see, you know, call it postmodernism, wokeism as a religion. And when you understand it from that framework, it makes sense. And even, I think, helps explain some of his change. By 2012, he wanted Mitt Romney to win. And after Romney lost, and we're going to play this clip, Peacock called the re-election of Obama worse politically for America than the Civil War. And here's that clip. I think in some that this election was the worst uh, political event ever to occur in the history of uh, this uh, continent. I think it was worse than the Civil War because uh, that war, everyone knew that at the end, freedom and normalcy uh, would return. But now we don't know that. We don't know that it won't, but we certainly don't know that it will. And for my further prediction, uh, check out my book, The Dim Hypothesis. I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but that was quite a blow. You know, again, you can say that's hyperbole, or he was seeing what was coming with wokeism. Yeah, but I mean, you're inferring a lot, because he gives these very short clips, right? And then you don't really, he doesn't get into it in a lot of depth. So you could make it out to be anything you want. Oh, he's really talking about wokeism as the, the M2. Or, you know, he doesn't give a lot of detail. It's not like he does like your own two hour shows where we really see what's the wheels turning inside his head. Well, I agree. And I, I think that he could have been clearer, especially if he's changed his views to let everyone know. One problem is that many objectivists are still using the dim hypothesis to say that, uh, you know, you should always vote for Democrats or that the, you know, Christian right is going to be where the threat is. And that doesn't seem to have been Peikoff's attitude for at least 10 years. Peikoff's attitude, at least his most recent videos, he's saying it's national socialism that's going to be the, it seems like he's saying national socialism is the M2, which I but agree. National with. socialism from the Democrats. That's what he said. And then his most recent clip about the truckers. Right. He thinks, and yeah, we'll get Democrats, into that. Right. Yeah. I don't want to jump the gun here. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that Peikoff said in that 2012 statement is that he 
he seems to have recognized that um, there was no like opposition to the Democrats. And so there was no frame, he said, quote, no framework to turn to other than religion. So at that point, he still believed that the threat was from religion. But he was starting to realize that um, it was the Democrats who are going to push us into accepting religion uh, because the Democrats didn't have, they were just nihilists. Right. Um, so he, he saw it as a catastrophe because Obama was going to just destroy the country. But he thought that after that, we'll turn to religion. So he, I think at that point in his mind, religion still meant Christian religion. It was Christianity. Like he's not thinking, oh, there's going to be this woke religion because there wasn't. Uh, right. he's, he's thinking that religion is Christianity. It's evangelism. It's, it's the fundamentalist Christianity. Well, he was saying because Christianity takes the human soul seriously. That's why it has lasting power. Whereas like the wokeism and the nihilism and socialism on itself, it doesn't take the soul seriously. It's too like crude. And, you know, so that's why he thinks Christianity has that lasting power to take over. Or at least he did. And I, you know, I think that that is a little too ivory tower view. And I think he's starting to, to, to change his tune on that. Well, in, uh, in 2013, Peikoff gives us a little more of his thinking. He did a debate with Jeroen Brook, chairman of ARI, on the subject of immigration. And uh, one of the interesting things he said was that he was concerned about the rate at which Democrats were moving us to destruction. And if I had seen the last few years under Obama, I would not have ended my dim book uh, the way I did. It's much worse. I would not have predicted this degree of speed and this degree of foreign uh, indifference and scooping out the military and nobody even bothering to worry about it. So to me, it's going very fast. And there are at least two major problems that relate to immigration. One is the strength of the Democratic Party. Now, both parties are no good. We know that, but also you see there's a difference in speed between if Bush stayed and if Obama stayed uh, uh, in office. That is Democrat versus Republican. One is the appeaser who does one, you know, one half of what the other is doing, and the other is a fast, loud, uh, and you know, you know, grabbing off more and more, and at a speed which is now uh, unbelievable. Well, the the key element he's talking about here is speed, but he doesn't, you know, is, does he mean the speed of the nihilism of the Democrats is going to lead to this big reaction of what Christianity or nationalism, but right? he doesn't really say, or is this the Democrats speed alone will knock everything down and create totalitarianism, right? He doesn't flush it out. So we have to really interpret what he's saying. That's right. It seems to be. He seems to mean the speed at which we're progressing towards the dictatorship. Right. That's how I saw it, too. The way I dis- made the distinction was the Republicans are the appeasers and the Democrats are the grabbers. So the Democrats just want to grab everything. They want to grab power in this area and that area. They're just out to get you. And then the Republicans are just like, all right, I don't want any trouble. Let's work with them compromise you know that's kind of his view right but that goes against dim right the whole if you listen to that clip closely he says if he'd seen what how obama had governed in his first couple of years that he would uh ended dim differently which i think represents an incredible amount of integrity to to be able to admit something like that but he yeah i think that's go go ahead dude well, he, he didn't say he would end it in, um, you know, saying that the, the Democrats and woke is going to destroy everything, right? Maybe he would end it saying, oh, we don't have 50 years. We really have 25 years or, you know, so. And that's part of it. I think he, he was kind of changing over time. And this this is capturing key moments of that those changes. 
Well, it's not clear how he would have ended it because he just says, I wouldn't have ended it the way I did. Right. <clears throat> so it's uh, a question, like what would he have changed? I think he's talking about speed, right? So I think primarily he would have predicted a quicker uh, dictatorship. Like, I think, what was it? Like 50 years or something he said in Dim? I can't remember the exact. Yeah, 50 years, he said 50 years. Yeah, 50 years. So he probably would have said like 10 years or 20 years, um, which we should also get into the timing because that's an issue between him and Yaron uh, in the debate. Right. And uh, we're going to, and I've, I've got lots of clips of uh, your own as well, talking about this, that we're going to play. But um, I do think that, um, you know, he is in some ways trying to say, I now see the threat coming from the left because they're moving us towards authoritarianism so much faster. Yeah, he's seeing it from the groups that we're allowing into the country and allowing to affect the direction of the country. So he focuses on Hispanics. Like there's 40 million illegal or no, 20, 10 or 20 million illegals. And he says that, you know, including the, the families and, and the future children and all that, we're going to have like 40 million new um, immigrants from Mexico or, or Spanish speaking nations who are basically going to vote for Democrats. And he's concerned about being a racist, but I don't, his view is just that as a group, they tend to vote Democrat. And that's something you're on challenged him on. And I don't really agree with him either. I, I think that it's really the problem of the Republicans that they can, they can't appeal to Hispanics. It's, well, they're hostile to Hispanics. It's they're not open. even that. I, I mean, th that argument just seems so old anyway, because if there was something he wasn't right about, a lot of Hispanics are starting to vote Republican because of values issues, because they don't like wokeism either. And maybe he didn't see that. But in terms of, you know, it's not even so much that, uh, you know, Democrats were going to use Hispanics to destroy the country per se. It was the idea that he could see them attempting it. Right. Yeah, I think what he was picking up on was just that people in general are voting Democrat. And so there's this threat, right? It's there's this threat from the voting from the voting population where that the voting population is going to bring about the democratic socialism. He always, quotes, he always quotes Mark Levin, like on all these. He loves Mark Levin, you know, the radio host. Yeah. And that's right. I'm, Mark's getting him worked up about immigrants. And I think, uh, when does Leonard Peikoff talk to immigrants? He's in some gated community in Orange County with all rich this white is, people. He doesn't know. He, you know. He's just getting this stuff secondhand. Yeah, but this is him saying that 10 years ago. I just, I think that argument's over. He's not even talking about immigration now as being the biggest issue. It's just, he's concerned about overreach of the government more generally. He's seen what the Democrats have done in the last 10 years. I think he is seeing that. He's seeing on the political front, he's seeing what the Democrats are doing. But, and that's pretty clear because, I mean, how can you miss what they're doing? But right. what, Dave, what Dave, I think, is saying is a good point because what Dr. Peacock does a lot is get his information secondhand. And you could see that in, in that immigration debate, he even admitted it. He said that he got his information from talk shows, radio, radio hosts. And so his facts could be wrong. Well, I'm sorry, but you're an objectivist. You should get your facts straight, you know? And it's, it's a problem because I, I don't think Iran gets his facts straight either. I think both right. of them, both of them are just, um, you know, ba basing their view on facts that they got secondhand. Um, and in this time, in this age where we have the internet, you can look for facts in pretty easily and get them from the source. You don't have to get them secondhand from some talk show host or from CNN. I guess I'm going to give an older person a little bit more of a break for not necessarily knowing how to utilize all the aspects of the internet for gathering information, uh, just from my experience with my own father. <laughs> yeah, but it's a problem when you're, you're putting yourself out there as uh, an expert in this and you're debating 
And you, you should prepare. You should get your facts straight. I don't think Iran got any facts wrong about the immigration thing. Yeah, yeah, he's it's probably not about immigration. Better. It's that he gets, you know, his main sources are like never Trumpers, like the dispatch or the bulwark. And, you know, that's that's coloring his view. If this is just immigration statistics. It's, you know, regardless of uh, right. a lot of the pro-Trump groups, you know, like Ann Coulter said, oh, there's 40 million immigrants in there. You know, they're, all their kids are, are determined to vote Democrat. And, you know, and I just Coulter think, turned on Trump. She she didn't think he went far enough for her. Yeah, but she's insane. Um, so <laughs> you're on actually corrected Leonard. And I think he was uh, he had his facts um, straighter than Leonard on in regard to the undocumented or illegal immigrants, because Leonard said there were 2 million. And then Yaron said there were more like 10. And I, I think that if you're in the ballpark there, uh, you're pretty good. I mean, it's, it doesn't really matter if there's 10 or 20. It's, there's millions, millions of illegal uh, immigrants. So that's going to have some effect. The question is, what effect do they have and how important is it to the threat of tyranny? Well, those are all fair points. I just think that, um, you know, that's where he was 10 years ago. It was the immigration thing. It was really, from what I understand, it was partially seeing the effects of immigration on California, where he was living, that, that sort of uh, affected him as well. But, you know, and, and I agree that, um, you know, he he didn't do a great job of talking about his change and why he changed. I mean, most of ARI did not or, or would not see what he saw. And perhaps due to that disagreement, uh, I mean, you know, he kind of backed away from uh, discussing politics just because he was getting older and, and your own did that part. But, you know, I, I think I've told you this, Dave. I mean, a big thing of me getting back into objectivism was, uh, your own calling us fifth column objectivists for being Trump supporters or Trump apologists, however you want to put it. But I got, you know, booted from some Ayn Rand social groups uh, a after that because they seemed to interpret it that anyone that was defending Trump too much mm -hmm. needed to uh, be basic, you know, they, they weren't a real objectivist. Okay. And, you know, that's the type of thing that you know, colors people and, and gets people angry. How many people left the movement as a result of that? And like many of us, we were all pleasantly shocked when uh, first news of um, Leonard's uh, contribution to Donald Trump came out in, in early 2020. And then he actually, um, you know, made a, a video uh, saying that he was voting for Trump and that he wanted to dispel anyone that said Trump supporters couldn't be objectivists. Uh, yes. I'm voting for Trump. That's it. Okay. <laughs> He's voting for Trump. <laughs> well, I think you got a big reaction to you, but uh, it was mostly, it was, I think most people here agree with you. I, I'm not arguing, but I heard somebody say no objectivists would vote for Trump. And I'm still steaming over that. So I'm trying to publicize the fact that whoever said that is crazy. Well, he wanted to say your own by name. That's true. But we yeah. found out later, and we, we discussed this on our first episode, that he was, in fact, referring to uh, your own. And they, they went and clarified it. And your own explained to him he was only saying apologists, not all Trump supporters. But, you know, right. you could say that both of them have been a little less than clear in ways that, you know, unfortunately, your own distinction between apologists and uh, supporters was lost on the um, admins that were booting everyone out of the Ayn Rand groups that were Trump supporters. Yeah, but you, because you would never criticize Trump. It was, you would defend anything he did. It wasn't like, okay, I'm voting for Trump, even though I know he's flawed. <laughs> you, you You're just sure that, that they were right to get rid of me. You didn't see any of this uh, from three years ago. 
No, just from what I've seen you write, it's, you know, you don't give any nuance with your defense of Trump. It's always anything he does. It's, it's, well, it's not about course. Trump per se. It's the same thing about seeing the Democrats as the threat. And then when I see someone like Trump being willing to fight, yes, I'm not going to go ahead and just nitpick every little thing as some sort of virtue signal to the left that I'm, I'm not just a Republican. I don't care what they think. Not to the left but to other objectivists, to your own values. It, uh, I am being true think, to my own values. I, I don't even the, care what, you know, people that just want the Democrats to win all the time, whether they're objectivists or not. I think the problem is that the people who were against Trump were expecting the people who supported Trump to criticize their own candidate during a campaign season. That's not how it works. You right. don't argue against your candidate during a campaign season. And it's not fair to ask a Trump supporter to do that. It's your job to criticize Trump. It's our job to, to promote him. So it, it appears to you that we're just Trump sycophants, but we're just Trump campaigners. We're just supporters. We're trying to get him elected. And, and so we could make the same criticism uh, of you. you say, well, why aren't you railing against Biden? You know, why aren't you red pilling us on all his problems? But, well, I mean, we all agree that Biden is horrible. It's just, you know, he was so we, bad. I didn't even want him to get elected. Obviously, but um, no, not obviously. Your own wanted Biden to lose less. OK, well, he is, you know, I don't think that's an unreasonable position. You know, but you can't so say he was against him. Biden then. Well, he was against Biden. He can be against both. He's against Biden and Trump, right? And maybe, you know, and he's trying to gauge which in the long run would be worse, which is not an obvious answer to a lot of objectivists. I mean, look at, okay, Leonard Peacock voted for Trump, but all the others did not. Ankar Gatte, Harry Binswanger, Greg Salmieri, they all came out against Trump. Not so everyone. Most... Andrew Bernstein, and I think even yeah. Binswanger came around at some point, didn't he? He, he started to waver at the end. Did he vote yeah. for Trump in 20? I thought he was the big anti-Trumper. He wrote all these articles. He, he was, was nice. against Trump, but I, I think in the end, he started to kind of change his, his attitude. If he, Maybe he didn't vote, but I don't think he voted for Biden. What I saw was right after the Peacock endorsement of Trump, he started uh, talking about the, you know, how the Democrats were talking about packing the court if they put ACB on. And uh, he was saying, well, if they're going to do that, maybe I, I you know, should vote for Trump as well. I, I don't know how he ultimately voted, but uh, that's saw that there were dynamic. Trump supporters and then there were people who were basically not going to vote. That's that's how I saw it. Right. No yeah. one voted for Biden, except maybe Greg. Actually, I think Greg Salmieri voted for Biden. OK, the problem so is. Go ahead. ARI's go. historical mechanism for um, you know, saying you're not a real objectivist if you believe X was turned on to Trump supporters in 2020. And it, you know, they kind of didn't publicize how Peakoff was voting, even if they knew. I mean, in the summer of uh, you know, when Peakoff's donation came out, I and I started talking about it before his his announcement, people said, well. We know that he contributed, but we don't know what that contribution meant, as, as if they were just trying to obfuscate and hide why, uh, you know, the fact that Peacock sees the, the left as a bigger threat. And how many other people besides me did the movement lose because they thought you had to think a certain way politically to be accepted? I think Peacock has to accept some blame for this because he took himself out of the conversation. He... He left ARI. He went to do his own thing, which is understandable. Well, look, you know, he's almost 90. He spent two weeks in the hospital with uh, COVID. You know, he said he just wants to write fiction. And, you know, I don't blame him for, for kind of stepping up. But then he does step in periodically about Trump and truckers, and which, you know, I think that is his discretion. He's paid his dues. I think it is a problem for ARI, though, that they're not promoting his opinion, his view. I mean, um, he founded ARI, so it's uh, ARI should at least, um, you know, make a note, an announcement or something that this is his view. Um, well, but so he doesn't I, run it, right? He appointed your own. Your own is the, 
the guy who runs it, you know, so he's, he's yeah. Off. Um, I just I think, just if, think you, if your found if your founder started uh, contradicting you, you would want to engage. You well, know? He did. did you see your own show about the truckers? And oh, uh, we did. We, we actually that's your own show. That's not AI. That's not the Ayn Rand Institute. That's your own. I I just wanted to go back a little bit because uh, you know I understand what you're saying about maybe Peakoff should have been a better communicator. I just. In the big scheme of things, I'm going back to the hierarchy of values. Yes, I could focus on that, but the bottom line is he is seeing what's going on. And, and I, you know, we're going to get to these uh, clips of him talking about the truckers. I, I, I mean, I think he's been a real champion lately. And, and I think I want to focus on that more, not ignoring the blame, but just that's the real <laughs> headline. Okay, but can we... Um, address one other thing before we move on sure uh, because dave uh, when we were discussing the 2004 clip i think dave you mentioned something about how uh, peacock relies on like secondhand information okay so one other thing that peacock does is he gets pretty emotional and he admits it like in the 2004 statement, he says that he's argued with some objectivists to the point of such exasperation that I can hardly remain calm in discussing it. And that was him calling Bush apocalyptic bad, because I guess he was getting some pushback at the time from objectivists. And then in this clip where he's um, promoting Trump, he says he was steaming about what Iran said. He doesn't admit that it, it was what Iran said, but he says he's steaming because he heard that someone said you can't be objectivist and vote for Trump. So he he gets real hot about these things. That's good. And, Every and, is implies an ought. <laughs> but uh, but I think it's a problem for a public intellectual. I think he he should remain calm and and have and project his most rational view. But you can be rational and passionate. I right? agree. Like, I think a, the, one of the but he says problems. he can't remain calm. He said in 2004 he couldn't remain calm. It's like he can't. He loses control. The left does that to uh, I mean, use the argument from intimidation. You know, the more rational and more clearly you see something, the more emotional you, it should make you because you see it clearly. And um, yeah, but uh, but you you churn it over, you chew it over, and you come into a calm, reasonable view of it. Was Ayn Rand super calm and unemotional? No, she was very emotional, very fiery. And, um, and I think a lot of objectivist intellectuals are violating the spirit, but not the letter of object. Like guys like Ben Baer and Greg and Don Watkins, you know, they're too calm, right? They don't say anything. They get the letter right. They don't say anything wrong, but there's no fiery spirit. I'm with Dave on this one. I want to see them all get more passionate. Okay, I'm the saying there's... Our side. There's a diff. There's a difference between using fiery rhetoric and being fiery, right? So you can be churning emotionally, which is is what I think Peacock is admitting to, and then you can just sprinkle your rhetoric with with charged language that is expresses your view in a powerful way, not necessarily admitting that you're all you know a bundle of emotions inside. Um, cause I think when you're arguing, when you're debating, you shouldn't be riddled with emotions. You should have a clear, con clear head and know what your logic is and your reason and, and be able to articulate it. I think you can have emotions without necessarily giving that up. Right. I don't, I don't think but, you can. I think that uh, you're, you're, if you're in an emotionally charged state, you're not thinking your best. You're not thinking clearly. Well, uh, I want more fiery intellectuals. What can I say? Yeah, um, there is a clarity problem. That's what I like about your own. He's, he answers questions, I think, better than anyone else. I think Peacock and Binswanger, sometimes I'm like, they're leaving out big chunks. You know, like there's a lack of clarity. Well, we've got some your own clips. We'll go over uh, to that point as well. But I, I want to get back to the um, kind of chronological order in uh 2017, we now know, he, he made this video uh, for his birthday of 2021. And in 2017, he, he met Alice, his, his girlfriend. And we now know from, uh, from that show 
um, that she was a conservative. And uh, let's hear that clip and, and uh, for more evidence of how he'd evolved by then. The other thing I can think of is to be asked the question, well, if she was Christian and you were an atheist, wasn't that a big issue? Now, for instance, she told me when uh, we first started out, if you weren't a conservative, I would never have gone out with you. You had to be, you know, the way I am politically. Uh, and, and I asked her one day, you said that, but you never said religion. And you know, I'm an atheist and you're a Christian. Why didn't that bother you? It didn't bother me because I never saw any sign of it in, except for her words. And she said, um, uh, oh, I didn't bother about you saying you're not a Christian. You're the best Christian I ever met. <laughs> and she took it, you know, as meaning morality, being a good person here on life. So we never had any problem about that. It never hid anything from her. We just didn't argue about it. There is such a thing as you agree to disagree, you know. That reminds me of the way he didn't argue with Iran. So he, he likes to avoid these political disputes with his friends. I uh, mean, I, this was more about their religion, but um, because that, according to what he said, and this was the crucial line, she told me when we first started out, if you weren't a conservative, I would never have gone out with you. You had to be the way I am politically. So, well, I think it's a sense of life response. And I feel the same way. Like, even though, you know, I have disagreements with conservatives, I get along better with them. They tend to be better people. Like you're in a red area, like people are more benevolent. They're nicer. You go to a lefty area, people are more narcissistic. They're not as open. You know, that, that kind of sense of life response, I agree with Dr. Peacock on. I agree that it is sense of life, but it's also a further clue in addition to what he's been telling us, that, you know, in 2020 and 2013, that, you know, he identifies as being a political conservative now. I also think it's great that he, uh, you know, it is more tolerant of Christians generally and, and can see it as a kind of just morality and trying to do the right thing. Well, I think his statement reveals that he either accepted her description of him as a conservative or he just kind of let it go because he kind of feels sympathetic to conservatives um, and it didn't really bother him that much. But, uh, you know, he, he either thought of himself as a conservative or he let her just entertain that and kind of under a false pretense. Well, she was 97, right? Oh, he's going to explain it to a 97-year-old, you know, the, his objectivist philosophies. I mean, sometimes you have to just let stuff go when you're in an old folks home. He's yeah, saying, I mean, that's, you get, you, you got to do some of that. I understand that. He's saying um, you had to be the way I am politically, not the way you are politically. So he's talking as himself. No, 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 no. I disagree with that, Scott. He's still talking in her voice. He's saying that you had to be the way I am politically. And then he went into his voice after that. I disagree. I think he's saying he's politically conservative, and that's why he wanted to focus more on why wasn't the Christian thing an issue. Well, he, yeah. at this point, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting, the kind of flip, because he, he sides with them more. But, I, you know, he, again, he's older, and... His all his influence, all the the radio hosts he's listening to that get him worked up are conservatives. I'm sure his gated community, it's all Republicans, and he just thinks like this is my team. You know, I, he feels more at home there because um, who's an objectivist, right? It's such a fringe thing. I mean, it's so, like your own feels more at home with the left, if given the uh, choice. Well, I wouldn't say that. He but, thinks that uh, the the blue states smarter. are smarter; they're more intellectual. I think that's true. I think objectively you could say that's true, but that doesn't, you know, mean I mean, it, it, de people. it depends what you mean by intellectual Are neo mystics intellectuals are, well, are Silicon Valley and wall street and all the financiers and all the people in uh, Boston tech, you know, uh, creating these things. You know, that's they, where it started out. Elon Musk moved and, and others are probably going to as well. 
I mean, it's not like everyone's wanting to move to California, even with how great it is. They're moving to Austin, Texas. They're not moving to Dallas or Houston, right? They're moving to a blue city in Texas. So, you know, again, your own point is the Republicans have to ask why they're turning off the high IQ tech people who we need to change a culture. I mean, I don't see it as that bad. I think that some tech people are starting to figure it out. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, part of the issue is that they've had control of the education system and they've been indoctrinating our kids for a couple of generations. You would think these guys would be smarter than that. But, you know, maybe like your own said, they're only smart when it comes to their work. And outside of that, they're completely helpless and irrational, which I've seen. For me, it's just how many people who saw the threat of the postmodernist left early ended up leaving objectivism because they didn't realize that Peikoff or, or anyone else agreed with them? Well, I think that objectivists are late to the party. I think that Gary Hall in the 90s recognized the problem of critical race theory, and we, no other objectivist really took up the mantle and went against it. Uh, but now suddenly they realize it's a problem. And this, this is an issue I have um, with a lot of objectivists is that they wait until you know the engine blows up before they try to fix it. So we're gonna get a dick, they're gonna like wait until the last minute until a dictatorship happens and then they'll be like, oh, let's fight it. No, you, you gotta fight the, the run up to it. You gotta fight the build up to it. You gotta fight it before it happens. Because it's the dictatorship is such a travesty to a country, you got to stop it before it happens. And this is my problem with the whole time, timeline issue, is that on one hand, I think it was during the uh, immigration debates, he defined what he considered to be an imminent threat. And he said the dict that would be a dictatorship within five to 10 years. And then I think later on, he says that he thinks a dictatorship is possible within 10 or 20 years. So which is it? Is it an imminent threat or isn't it? I think that 10 years is, a, is an imminent threat. And if he thinks that there's a dictatorship within coming within 10 years, he should be all on board with the truckers and Leonard and everybody trying to do whatever they can to fight it. Yeah, I mean, I had an issue with your own kind of nitpicking the truckers. He's like, okay, yeah, they're fighting for freedom, but yeah, they, they were honking their horns too much and blocking traffic <laughs> and violence. It's like, okay, that emph emphasis and selection is a, is a big deal here. I would never have brought that up. And, you know, he was saying the truckers, they don't, uh, they don't really understand what freedom means. It's like, okay, right. They're not objectivist philosophers, but the trend is good. They want the government mandates gone. They want to be free to work, even if they're not really intellectually aware. Their instinct, their sense of life is good and should be supported, which is what I think Dr. Peikoff was, was identifying. And right. um, maybe your yeah. own's just trying to make the right better, you know, more intellectual. Uh, so when we do have a revolution, we actually know what we're fighting for. But I think he was a little too overly critical of the truckers. Well, that's fair. Uh, you all have given a great lead in to uh, Leonard Peikoff's comments about the Freedom Convoy. He made a, a statement of unequivocal support for the, uh, you know, for the truckers currently protesting the vaccine mandates. Um, here, Peikoff says very definitively that the threat of national socialism, which as we talked about, he's been predicting, is actually coming from the Democrats. I believe that totalitarianism in the form of some kind of national socialism uh, is on its way, that the Democrats are pushing for it and the Republicans are impotent. They're not strong enough. They don't fight it in the right way. So that's a man who sees the fascist threat that he's been warning about from Democrats. I would put it this way. Um, so first of all, I think we've learned from his prior predictions to question them. So I want to question his prediction. Is it national socialism or is it like international socialism or some, some like democratic socialism? Should we be naming it something else? Because I, I don't really see like a Nazi thing coming, up, coming about. 
I see something else. It's it's yeah. a distinctive American form of it was never going to be an North exactly, American. It was never going to be an exactly the same form. I I think you're right to question that. I've heard some people say that well, you know, it's a fine line between fascism and just an oligarchy, where these uh, company heads are, are taking control and. Um, you know, but yes, I, I think it's fair to, to question the form it's going to come in or what's going to happen. Let me give one example real quick, because with the trucker convoy, um, one of the first things Biden did was push Trudeau into exercising his federal powers to unblock the ambassador bridge, um, I guess, yeah. between Michi Michigan and Canada. He was egging him on. Yeah, he was, so that's kind of like this international cooperation to violate people's rights and, you know, basically put down a rebellion, right? There's this rebellion, there's this, the way I see it, there's this rebellion going on against a tyranny. And then you have Biden and Trudeau working together to put it down. I don't think international socialism or Marxism could ever take hold in a, a Western country, like a, a post enlightenment country. So that's why, like, Germany wasn't international social. It was national socialism. As the right becomes more nationalist, the left becomes more socialist, the two will eventually merge. Or the left could just adopt national socialism. Because they constantly talk about race. Uh, right. And, and then you have uh, issues of national pride and immigration. So those are the things people are fiery about. You know, identity, nation, and then race gets mixed in, and um, yeah, but what is the national identity that Americans will rally around? Geography. Um, they don't geography. really have any ideas. Yeah, borders, right? Borders, language, and culture. That's the... I'm sorry, uh, this is all this kind of framework that's built up around the dim hypothesis that believes it's impossible for the left to win long term. And the author of the dim hypothesis does not believe that anymore. Well, I can't say for certain what he believes, but based on those clips, yeah, he seems to be changing, doing a 180. He's saying the Democrats, whoa, we got to stop these guys. They are nuts. They're, you know, uh, driving us right over a cliff, which I think they are. And he never mentions the threat from the right in any recent statements, public statements yeah. he's that's that's a fair reading. Um, now, here's Peacock talking about the need for a physical protest in light of what the Canadian government has been doing. I mean, the government is coming after a protest. They're trying to stop people from expressing what they want. So what can we do? The only way, I think, to show, to stop it for a while, to slow it down, is massive physical protest. I don't know of an intellectual way. In the long run, of course, ideas, philosophy, that has to change and that's the ultimate solution. But right now, it is crucial to make it clear to the world and the world is going along with the truckers too. I think that that's an important point he's making and uh, maybe people haven't been focusing on it enough. It's this idea that there needs to be a physical, visible, tangible uh re you know resistance to the tyranny that's rising um otherwise it appears that everyone just supports it and goes along with it and i think that's a important distinction he's making is is this the what does your country look like does it look like a bunch of sheep going along with the dictators or does it look like a bunch of wolves attacking the dictators yeah, that's part of, uh, you know, how <laughs> relatively afraid you should be. Are there other people willing to take up the cause? It, it, it's the cowardice of the liberty movement that uh, is part of the reason we're, a lot of us are so concerned. Well, also, Canada is a much more oppressive than the United States in terms of COVID restrictions. Um, it, you know, it's fascinating. I mean, it's the first time I've ever felt proud of, of Canadians and thinking, wow, look at what they're doing. And, um, you know, I, I mean, he's saying, Peacock is saying, I'm all for ideas in the long run, but come on, people, at some point, it's time to get out of our rationalistic bubbles and fight for our lives. 
I think the thing is that idea, your ideas can be wrong or misguided or half correct, um, especially when you're the you you set yourself up as this prophet of doom, like like Peacock does to some extent, and 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 Dr. Book does to some extent. You could be wrong. You're you're predicting about the future. You don't really know. You so what's important here is that he's drawing attention to the truckers on the ground right now, the facts on the ground. And he's saying, this is what's happening. And this, and they're fighting a good fight against an evil regime. And that's something we can support right now. And I think that's what he's pointing at. Is he saying, let's get some action. Let's do this. And not just talk, not just like, oh, let's worry about the future. Let's start doing something about it. Yeah, here's uh, Peacock talking about the truckers setting an example for future courageous action of others. People see that, you know, it's possible. Uh -huh. It's a way of turning it around. It's not going to be omnipotent. No, no but one rally like that. However, the great it is, and however much it stops all these people for a moment, uh, can do it. But, but the hope is that it can be a catalyst. It can be light diffuse. And then go on uh, from there, pick up what's better, because I think there is a large body of the public that's there and that opposes what's going on, but uh -huh. they're intimidated and they don't know what to do about it and they feel they're alone. So uh, they go along with it. That's, I don't expect miracles from the truckers, but just to open the door for somebody else to say, I have the courage to walk in now. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And, you know, look, all the mask mandates are, are lifted now. Like, I think, I know in New York, I think California too, you don't need to wear a mask to go into a coffee shop. I went, for the first time in two years, I went into a Starbucks without a mask on Friday. That, well, you well, still need, you still, I'm in California and in the Los Angeles area, and you still need to wear a mask to get into <laughs> restaurants. But of course, they don't make you wear it while you're eating. So what happens is, People enter these buildings, you know, with their virtue signaling mask wearing, and then they just take it off and it's like normal. So it's, it's getting to the point where it's, it's like a show of respect for the mandates in the beginning, and then you just go about your business. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, he talks about bravery. I mean, this to me is part of why I love DeSantis so much, because he, with his example as governor actually got other governors to start relaxing their restrictions yeah i love to say this i would vote for him in two seconds and i assume yeah florida's been open for basically two years but i think in general there is a large resistance against the mandate you see these um these parents rising up against the uh, school boards um you see and the truckers of course uh, so there are groups that are resisting and saying enough with the mandates they're silly and all of that and but what and they're like being painted say, as practically terrorists yeah and, and of course they're being called selfish you know do you want to kill your grandma that's still going on so <laughs> i see it yeah it's uh, yeah. you know we cannot tolerate any level of uncertainty or risk. It took two years for people to finally see this virus was completely overblown and to put pressure on politicians to remove the mandates. That's the only reason they took them away because they saw the polls and they were, oh, people don't want this anymore. I don't want to lose an election. But that took two years for people to get calm enough to uh, have some of their freedoms restored. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I meant to mention in that video, um, he's interviewed by ex-wife Amy Peacock and uh, Ben Chase. And, um, you know, I used to not be an Amy fan, but she has really come around as well. She's been fantastic on all this stuff. Um, she actually asks Peacock a question about, you know, what can the truckers be doing to help support an intellectual uprising? And he's saying he doesn't even want to place that burden on them. I have great respect for the truckers, but I don't expect him to lead an intellectual uprising. That is not fair to expect that. Their work is not in that field. They can demand freedom. They can demand that we go back to American, you know, they, on that level. But 
all they can do is raise a banner. They can't argue for it. What they can do is make it possible for people to hear those who have a banner. So I don't ask the truckers to do any more, but keep at it. Keep at it. You notice he says it, they're making it possible for, for intellectuals to be heard, but who's being heard from ARI? I, I think that the Ayn Rand Institute is missing a big opportunity here. They can inject themselves into this movement, become part of it, and start talking to the truckers. And if, if the truckers aren't intellectuals, okay, let's make them intellectuals. Let's give them the arguments they need to support their movement. Uh, that's my big problem with, with a lot of objectivists and objectivist organizations is that they're, they seem to be standoffish when it comes to these physical protests. They don't want to get near them. But they should be getting in there. They should be at least speaking to them. I think that's Tal Safani's orientation and to some extent your own Brooks that they're like long run. We, you know, we look, we need to train 10,000 intellectuals to take over academia. You know, why should we talk to truckers who will go away in a month? Um, I, I mean, it can be a fine line between being long run and not wanting to take action now. It's well, the difference it, between going to the front line and staying in the rear. Well, if they're you, not, they're not, they don't want to go on the front line because they don't think that's where the energy is going to matter. They think, you, you know, you got to train intellectuals and look 50 to hundred years out. That's the only way we win, but it's but, all going to matter. I, my position is that it all matters. The, the people on the front line matter people, the generals in the back matter, yeah. the, the intellectuals in the universities matter. You got to cover the whole spectrum for, for courage you got to train your front line, your people on the ground. You know, if, if they're just clueless and don't know how, if, if, if Yaron's right and their method is wrong, then he needs to teach them the right method. Start teaching them the right method or else go away. You're not, you're not well, helping. You're not helping by just being a method critic with no alternative method. So if that's all he was doing, I would agree with you. But if you look at his show, it's, he's a frontline guy, right? He's not, in the back just training college professors um and he well, showed got some clips of his but i just want to end with uh this last clip of peacock because he just ends with a message of full support which i think is also something that would be uh you know great to see more of in the movement i just want to end by saying i salute the truckers i wish them the best i congratulate them and don't let them stop you Thank you. He got teary eyed there. He looked, you know, very emotional. Meant it. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it was reminiscent of Rand saying, you know, don't let it go. The best within you. Look, he's almost 90 and he's still fiery. He wants to stop this crap. You know, he could just say, well, it's not my problem. You know, I'll be dead in a few years. But he's like, no, I, you know, let's, uh, I, yeah, let's fight for liberty. And I think Yaron is doing that. And I don't, do you watch your own every show? I, Scott does. I see Scott on the chat. I, I don't watch every show. I follow Scott's summaries and other what other people say about it. And then I watch, um, I watch firsthand when I want to when I want to um, actually refer to something he said. So his he's growing rapidly. He's getting like a hundred new subs a day. He's almost at like thirty two thousand like a month ago or a few weeks ago. He was at twenty eight thousand because they're doing these short clips now these minute long clips that action Jackson. Yeah. I'm, I'm aware of those. He's paying for those. I mean, that's they're working. They're, okay. He's paying a marketer to, to try an experiment and it's working and it, it shows growing and he's uh, he's a frontline guy. He's really the only frontline guy. I guess the, I, I have uh, to take issue with that. I, yeah, so I disagree. Many of his comments just seem excuses not to take action. I'm working on the long run. Nobody's good enough. No, no one's fighting it the right way. We actually have some clips of your own talking about, uh, you know, the the truckers' methods and and why he disagrees. Well, Here's you that. said he's a. Hold on, Scott. Can I say something? Sure. Um, so. You said he's a, a frontline guy, but what does that mean? He's spe he sp goes to um, groups and speaks to them at universities. He goes to corporations and speaks to them. He does his podcast. That's not really the front line. 
The front line is on the street. Where is he on the street? He's not on the street. He's not out what there with the protesters. To he's going to go to Canada and, and get in a truck. I mean, he's an intellectual. Why not? Why not? He's an intellectual. He's not a, you know, uh, a street protester. You know, he's gonna... okay. So he's not. Uh, he's not a frontline guy. But I he's a, he's a he's a a parent. He's like an intellectual who tries to inform the generals, right? But most of the intellectuals at ARI don't even get on the radio, right? They're just writing and they have some blogs. And he's actually doing the four days a week. I mean, yeah, if you want to compare him to them, that's okay. But just compare him to what needs to happen at this point for objectivism to be a cultural force. He's in Puerto Rico, usually. Yeah. And he's way away from the front line. He's not on the front line. Maybe if he traveled to the mainland uh, and joined the American trucker convoy, or at least met them somewhere in D.C. and spoke to them, then I would consider him on the front line then. I don't know if that... Well, he's, he's looking at what's the best use of his abilities. And, okay, uh, let's imagine that he had a fundraiser on his show to send him to D.C. to speak to the truckers. Do you, how much money do you think he'd raise? I think he'd raise a lot. Well, let's do it. Talk to him. He, Ask he him doesn't to do want that. to do that. He's not he, a frontline guy. I, you know, we got to define frontliner. I mean, does frontline have to be you're physically in the ground driving a truck? Or I think if you are doing a podcast that's growing over 100 subscribers a day, that is amazing progress than if you just flew out to some remote area with some truckers yeah. well let me know when he breaks a thousand lives live viewers i want to know like when he's really attracting live viewers because to me that's the that's when you've made it is when you've started increasing in your live viewers look he got four thousand new subs in like two weeks you know that's a okay lot. but subs are nothing you can buy subs well, he's not, what do you mean buy subs? He's not buying subs. You not. can, you can, I'm not saying he's doing it, but you can buy subs. Subs, subs is just some guy who saw one of your videos and thought it was cool and then pressed the subscribe button. Live viewers are people who tune in to hear you at that moment. That, that is some power. And I would respect, you know, that if he has a lot of live viewers and okay. I, I think he should do that. You should focus Let's on that. Play some of your own comments that we have here, and maybe that'll give us a good um, focal point in the debate. Now, this uh, next clip is uh, your own saying he disagrees with the truckers' methods. And again, I know in America today, the right to protest is considered, oh my God, the most important thing in the world. But no, it's not. You have a right to speak. You have a right to speak on your property, not on mine. And roads should be treated as if they're private property. Sidewalks should be treated as if they're private property. Yeah, I don't agree with his emphasis on that. It's like of all that's going on in the world, you're going to bring up sidewalks. Is like right. the thing you're, you're inconveniencing people. Yeah, okay, but we're <laughs> we're fighting tyranny. Like, okay, you're going to be inconvenienced. You know, I mean, the COVID restrictions over the last two years were a far greater inconvenience than any kind of honking on the street. Yeah, this is the sort of method critic that even Martin Luther King Jr. faced. Um, I, if you're not familiar with that, I recommend reading the, his letter from the Birmingham jail where he talks about the white moderates and how they are the real stumbling block to um, civil rights. And how the, they say they agree with the goal, but not the method of getting to the goal. So I think that's kind of where Yaron's coming from. And, and you see that you saw that with the immigration debate. He disagreed with um, restricting immigration. That's the method of stopping the dictatorship. And now he's disagreeing with the truckers method. So he's always complaining about the method. But he's well, saying not they're not fighting right is a way of never having to form alliances. Well, it's a way of ignoring what needs to happen in order to change the problem, to fix the problem. We, we're, the truckers are facing a government that's violating their fundamental rights to move across the border and forcing them to get a vaccine or just like stay in Canada. 
So this is a fundamental right they should have is to freely move around and get to their house and get to their work. If they have to cross the border, they should be able to cross the border without having to let someone jab them with a needle and with a serum in it that they don't want. It could be the best thing. It could be just like vitamin C, but it's the principle that's that they sh- that they're fighting for. The principle is that they should have this bodily autonomy. They shouldn't have to be putting things into their body just to get from work to home. And sometimes you have to have a way to ramp it up besides just shouting from your own property, uh, just to let them know that these violations after two years, you know, when you escalate, we escalate. Um, but here's your own on the type of uh, civil disobedience that he says he would support. Just like I despise and hate the fact that lockdowns destroyed small businesses because we couldn't, weren't allowed to leave. Imagine if during the lockdown, all the small businesses got together like the truckers and said, we're just going to open. Let them come and shut us down and arrest us. That I would have supported 100%. Because nobody's rights are being violated. That's real civil disobedience. Okay, I mean... I don't disagree that that's a great tactic to do to say, look, we're not complying with this. We're going to keep our restaurants open, but why can't you do both? And also, you know, I mean, Antifa for like a year blocked plenty of roads, you know, right. and, uh, you know, so the, I mean, did these truckers really even block roads or was it just kind of a traffic jam, you know? Well, they were letting, they did it so they would let emergency vehicles through from what I understand. But the the deeper issue is that, you know, he could have organized such a movement two years ago when it was starting or any time in between. But, you know, when when people, some people were being brave two years ago, like the woman trying to cut hair who got her license revoked or in California, I remember at some points they were talking about cutting electricity to places that they thought mass gatherings were happening at. Yeah, well, look at Trudeau. He what did he do? He did some emergency powers with the truckers. He froze yeah. their bank accounts or something outrageous. They're going after their bank accounts and they're tracking them down. And um, right, Black Lives Matter never had a bank account frozen. Antifa never had a bank account frozen. That's right. When Black Lives Matter were protesting, it was more like our laws are too restrictive. We need to back down on uh, how we enforce the law. You can't freeze something that doesn't exist. <laughs> Listen, I think they have money. Those the founders of BLM, they're rich. These are yeah. rich. Love. Yeah, but the pe- the people on the street who were throwing rocks at, you know, and tear gas or not tear gas, but uh, what, what were they doing? They're throwing acid at the police. <laughs> I don't think they had any money or bank accounts. They had to be bailed out of out of jail by, you know, the big wigs who yeah. yeah. Well, New York hey, you know, did a show uh, recently about how he, um, if he started his own island country, um, you know, what he would do is the, the national defense would be three nukes, one pointed at D.C., Beijing, and uh, Moscow. And it's a bit just showing a type of, you know, he doesn't have any intermediate steps. Well, he's all or nothing. So this is another complaint I have is that when you, when you see these protests come up and then Yaron doesn't agree with it and then someone like Leonard comes along and agrees with it, what, what's really happening is Yaron saying it's not enough. It's, it's never enough. We, he wants the truckers to be these intellectuals who are all like fighting for all of our rights to be restored. They're completely... Uh, capitalists and you know they're gonna they're gonna charge uh, at the enemy with a with a philosophy of reason and liberty but th- when is that going to happen that's not going to happen he and Leonard comes along and he says look this is a this is a battle a skirmish in the bigger war we should support it because they basically agree with us they're fighting for something uh, some sort, some element of freedom. They're fighting for to get rid of the vaccine mandates. Uh, so Yaron agrees, 
that he he agrees with their goals. He says, uh, yeah, I'm against these vaccine mandates. Okay, well, if you're against them, join the truckers. Don't nitpick their method. Right. They're, I, I, they're, they're fighting the way they can fight. They're truckers. They're putting their trucks on the line. They are actually um, very courageous in putting what they have out there to fight the way they can. You just reminded me, I heard they're uh, starting to um, look into seizing the actual trucks under the emergency powers. Oh, yeah. I'm sure Trudeau's Trudeau's going to Trudeau's going to smash them. But the point is, we need to support them. We, we need to say, look, we, we don't agree with what Trudeau's doing. We support the truckers. And if you can give money to them, that's great. If you can um, just give moral support, that's great. But why, why just like nitpick their method when they're, they're basically lashing out? They're like a, a caged human trying to break free, you know, mm-hmm. and they're, do- they're doing what they thought of, what they think will work. And whether it works or not, you know, we'll see. I agree. And I see these objectivists commenting like exclusively that their, you know, their method is, is rights violating. And like, who was that guy? Uh, Will, I, I sent, I sent you screenshots of, and emphasis and selection is such an important thing in a movement. So yeah, I disagree. I think, see, I'm willing to, to say your own, I think was wrong here, but um, yeah, I just want to push back on something William said earlier about just about subscribers not being a big deal and it's only about a live audience. Sure. I think subscribers are a big deal because he was at 28,000 for, I don't know, six months. And then he found a new method to bump up to 32,000. And I, you know, I see him chugging along, making progress and I, you know, more than any other uh, ARI intellectual. And I just don't know how, I think it just seems unrealistic to have, your own go out to the truckers and with a blow uh, with the not a blow horn a, a loudspeaker and um i, I think the, so the way subscribers work is um once you reach a certain amount you just kind of naturally start getting more subscribers because people start seeing your videos more they get out there and then you get these people just clicking subscribe because they like to click subscribe on whatever video they like. But if, if you're on serious about reaching serious people, then he needs to attract people who will watch him live or at least watch his videos regularly. So it's more video count, like how, how many people, unique people are watching his videos and how many live people are watching his videos. Um, you know, Joe Rogan blew up and he gets a bunch, he gets uh, hundreds of thousands of live viewers. So it's, but we're I'm not saying we you know, need that ten, many. You know, give it 10 years. I mean, but uh, he was stagnant for so long. <laughs> and he tried this one minute clip approach that were, they're very good one minute clips. And that's exciting people. And that's how I think Jordan Peterson got big. These short clips of inspiring, non-nihilistic uh, well, he's, he's out there full throated supporting the truckers right now. He became famous for standing up against forced pronouns. That that's more than just him doing short clips that made the difference. Yeah, I've always said that Euron. So Euron says that he wants to be canceled. He, he's trying to get canceled because he thinks it'll be good for him. Well, if he wants to get canceled, do things like support the truckers. You know, how hard is it? He's almost basically there. He's just a method critic. Why doesn't he just go, he just forget the criticizing of the method and just support the trucker's goal and see how far he gets. And I'm sure he'll get a lot more subscribers that way. And if he, he can also do other things, you know, go hard against Trudeau, go hard against Biden. You know, he'll get a lot of, a lot more subscribers that way. If that's what he, if that's what he really wants. But he believes the threat is from the right. I know. I mean, that's the problem. Is that yeah. He's... I mean, uh, now just going back to the clips, uh, you know, when after Peacock made the video stating support for the truckers and, you know, your own's already come out with a different view, he tried to paint it as kind of a minor disagreement at, based on the same thing as the debate from 10 years ago that uh, Leonard thinks we're closer to tyranny than your own does. Um, I completely agree with 
Leonard, that if we're in a state of tyranny, or on the verge of a state of tyranny, if tyranny's here, uh, you know, first of all, under a state of tyranny, everything's allowed in a sense. Whatever you think will move us towards a state of freedom, or, or, or slightly greater freedom, or making your voice heard, or just standing up, is absolutely legit. And I say Well, your own uh, standard for tyranny is if we've lost free speech. Like he said that all the time. He's, uh, you know, as long as we can exactly. speak, we're not living in a state of tyranny. That's the standard. You know, first you can say, you know, what, what does losing free speech mean? Do the truckers have free speech? But beyond that, he's also said that he, even if we lose free speech, he still won't fight unless he thinks we can win. Well, well, to what Dave said is he, so the, the gen, I would say that the general objective of his view is that once free speech goes, then you're in a dictatorship. Uh, but what we're tra trying to talk about here is, are we on the verge of tyranny? And he's saying that we're not on the verge of tyranny. So, but, it, and if we were on the verge of tyranny, then everything would go. You'd, you'd lash out however you can against the, the government. But what I want to point out is that there's this lack of dialogue around this idea of when are we in a tyranny? When, when is the dictatorship happening? Are we in a dictatorship? How close How are we, we to a dictatorship? It? Yeah, the, we need to measure it somehow. We need to point to facts, the facts that everyone can agree on that show or disprove that we're approaching or in a dictatorship. If there's any objectivist intellectuals not busy with talk shows like some of the other guys at ARI. Yeah, you'd think that this would be the primary concern of something like the Ayn Rand Institute. Or how to prepare ourselves when it comes. Well, what do you mean? Like we should all get guns and guns, AMO, food? I mean, uh, I think at least do the minimum. being prepared against... Uh, you know, leftist tactics using double standards, uh, the argument from intimidation. Um, so the, just... min the minimum would be pick a side. Are you on the <laughs> government or are you on the resistance? You know, there's there's this line forming, right, between people who are resisting the government and the government. Which side are you on? Well, he would That's... view it as, well, what if the resistance is worse than the government? Like the cure is worse than the disease. Which yeah, you can say that anytime you want to just bow down to the government. Well, I don't think but you that's what we need to establish. We, yeah, need, I, I don't, we, we need to figure but, that out. Yeah, I don't agree with him that the cure is worse than the disease in this context. I think it's just his view that the, the cure is worse than the disease is still based on this misinterpretation of the dim hypothesis that, you know, the left can't last or whatever, you know, that. Right. It just, but, <laughs> that but just let's isn't take this, what Leonard Peikoff thinks. Let, let's take this particular example of the Freedom Convoy. Is the cure worse than the, the disease? The disease, apparently, in this case, is people are disturbed by honking and traffic jams. Is that worse than a dictatorship trying to force you to get a vaccine in order to cross between borders? I agree it's, a thousand percent. Yeah. Okay. So in particular, in particular battles, you, I think we can figure this out. There, we can point to the facts, which, what, what is this side and what is that side and which one's worse? I think it's, we're able to make that identification and the evaluation between the two uh, sides. But that's something that's not really happening. I mean, we're, we're still bickering over whether uh, it's a violation of rights to block someone's driveway. You know, this, this is not going to get us anywhere. We're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna unravel the mysteries of property rights at this moment. We need to pick a side. Yeah, I, I think uh, here, your own says what I think is his most revealing part that even if it's time for a revolution, he still seems to be a maybe based on conditions of, of the people we're fighting with. And if, if, if we're in tyranny, then let's have a revolution. And I'm, I, I'd be supportive, maybe, right? Depending on who exactly was revolting and what were they revolting for? What were they trying to achieve? So I think 
he's revealing that he's still going to have kind of a cautious attitude even when we're in tyranny. There's a certain point at which you have to say, you know what, I need to make terms with the least irrational 50% I can find and, you know, try to fight for freedom. Well, we're not there yet. I mean, in some ways we're winning, right? All these COVID restrictions are being removed. You because know, like, of what, the truckers in many cases. Well, yeah, partially because of the truckers and because- partially, partially because of DeSantis. It's not partially because of the people saying we just need to, you know, let the government do its thing and it's not going to be that bad long-term. Look how much effort it took to just convince people of the futility of all these masks. You know, we had Fauci- spouting all this nonsense for months and months and it took the great barrington declaration and other people to point out that he was just full of it it's it's just so much effort to have to go through to point out the nonsense that we're hearing from the ex so-called experts and people in government um we have at some point we got to decide enough is enough and we need to just remove these fools and you know fight for some change at least get rid of um you know trudeau or get rid of the person in charge and replace him with something somebody else and see what happens i mean that's the minimum we can hope for right because you know we're not going to overthrow the police state but i think that one thing that we can do in this case is support the truckers because all the truckers really want is uh, the end to the the vaccine mandates? I mean, how right? It's not, not like these not BLM, a... uh, you know, lofty goals of like ending racism or something that can never be achieved. So they can always just have a reason for pushing it, their agenda. Well, I you think know, that's happening. I think you know the mandates are ending. I think the this COVID mania is is coming to an end. But it's the fighters that bear the credit. The ones who've taken the slings and arrows. I, I, just, I, I you know, I, uh, how much did Ron DeSantis do? He's one governor. You know, I think people overall are realizing this was overblown and they, they're not afraid anymore. That's why these are going away. It's not because of what Peacock was saying that the truckers would make it so it would help encourage other people's courage. Yeah, but this was happening before the truckers. It's like a few truckers yes. in Canada isn't changing the whole culture. Uh, one governor in Florida isn't changing the whole. I think to start, all, and Peakoff said you can't ask them, expect them to change the culture all by themselves. It's one step. Well, I agree, I, it's a good thing, but um, you know, there's enough reason out there, and people like freedom enough to uh, to unwind some of these controls. You know, so right, but, and those I, are just but, but that un- making. There's no one rallying them in you know in the in the liberty movement not near enough as far as i'm concerned you know that unwinding doesn't happen naturally i think my my point is that it's things like the trucker protests that cause the unwinding because it's so much pressure against the mandators that they can't take it anymore and they they just well in trudeau's case he's not even backing down the truckers didn't do enough the truckers are going to get smashed there more needs to be done and, and you're on saying he's he's against the, the method that failed. Well, okay, so what method is going to work? I mean, are, yep. are we are we only is the only method that's going to work uh, just revolutionizing academia? Is that the only thing that's going to work? In the long run, yes, but uh, short run, yeah. I don't know if Trudeau's, Trudeau is going to win. I don't think that's a given. Um, well, he's already cracking down, right? Yeah, but, but I mean, at least the Ottawa police are. I'm not sure if uh, I'm, I'm not sure if he's if Trudeau's gotten any federal powers yet, has he? I don't know, but I think there's backlash to that. You know, when authoritarians overreach and crack down too much, and they piss off more people. You know, so it could be a Tiananmen Square kind of thing. My concern is that you know when he says, "If we're in tyranny, I'd support a revolution." Maybe, you know, it's just like he's. You get the idea. Even if he did believe it was that bad, you know, then it, is, is he still going to be no libertarians, no Dennis Prager, no Trump supporters, you know, in our group? And he's still going to be trying to, to shape the, the boundaries of it while the world's collapsing around us. I, 
I do so want can, to. Can we answer the question though? Do you, are we on the verge of tyranny, or are we in tyranny, basically? Because I think that what we're going to see is we're not going to see our granddaddies a dictatorship. We're not going to see a Hitler or a Stalin. We're going to see something else. It's it's going to be an American form of dictatorship, and I think it'll be kind of uh quasi free will quasi have free speech you know we'll, we'll kind of be able to speak you know but but it won't be tolerated if you have a loud enough voice so like, like you said social yeah so if you on social media uh you you can speak freely as long as you remain under the radar of the censors and then once you get a big enough platform or you know you have a wide enough voice then they shut you down what what kind of dictatorship do you think we're going to have? And do you think we're in one or approaching one very quickly? I think we are approaching it. If you look at inflation and, and uh, lack of rule of law. Um, but I, you know, I, again, you got to look at day-to-day examples. Okay. I can still go out, go to work, get a cup of coffee. You know, I don't have to just show my papers to any police officer who asks. Um in America, I think you do, there are pockets of the country where you're basically still free. Um, but in other pockets, you've got to show a vaccine card to go places. Um, there are still mandates. Um, children, children have to wear masks to go to school. Um, so there are, and you know, and that this isn't even including all of the other things that objectivists consider violation rights, you know, so like a involuntary taxation all that yeah but when you and then the the pressure on a medical industry to socialize they're socializing medical insurance there's all, all these intrusions into the economy from the government at what point do you say okay even though we still elect our president and our senators we're, we're basically in a dictatorship of the majority we are approaching that rapidly, but I still think, you know, uh, basically the lights work, internet works, there's food in the supermarket. We're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction. Spiritually, we're becoming more docile, more submissive to authority. Uh, people are afraid to speak out. I look, they tried to destroy Joe Rogan because they didn't like what he said about vaccines. And he actually apologized for, I mean, which was insane. Um, so we're moving there. I don't know if we're on the verge. Things it's, feel a little too cushy. Life is too cushy to really be on the verge of. Well, technology is still improving. It's funny that this is a theme of Atlas Shrugged. I mean, ultimately, the ones that thought things had gone too far went to the gulch. And the scabs were people like Dagny and Hank at the beginning that weren't ready to give up on the world yet. I think what the, the main indicator to me that we're basically on the cusp, like Leonard says, of a dictatorship is that we now have this uh, large segment or like a, minor, a large minority of people who are being punished and ostracized. And they're the unvaccinated. They're the ones who don't agree with the government mandates. Uh, these people are being harassed. They're being pushed out of their jobs. There's so much social and governmental pressure on them to just go away and basically die. I don't know what the government wants these people to do, not, not have a job and not be able to support themselves. That's basically the, the problem in Canada. And it, I don't know what Biden's going to do, but once the truckers start rolling across America, is he going to unleash the federal powers and, and bring the army against them? I mean, what's he going to do? Is he, is he going to stop them from living their lives? It depends how Canada turns out, probably. Australia is even worse than Canada. They have Canada. That's true. And, you know, I, you know, I, I want to say something. Uh, this last clip of your own from a couple of days ago, to be fair, your own does ha uh, claim to have a line in the sand. And uh, here he is saying that if Trudeau passes his emergency powers, then he'll back the truckers. You know, to the extent that it, it's bringing out the true nature of Trudeau's authoritarianism, you know, if Trudeau passes all this stuff, 
I'm on the trucker side. I mean, uh, he becomes at that point a, a true authoritarian, and everybody, uh, all bets are off at that point. So I think that's great that he does have a line in the sand, um, but I'm not sure, you know, what exact, we talked about how sometimes they're unclear about what they're really saying. But what, you know, is this just if Trudeau's measures are approved by the Canadian Senate? I mean, doesn't it make Trudeau an authoritarian just based on pushing these measures in the first place? Yeah, he is. Yeah, I mean, your honor is saying that the true nature of Trudeau is an authoritarian. So why isn't he backing the truckers now? I mean, the truckers are fighting an authoritarian. So the only... His line in the sand is whether the authoritarian gets his way or not. You know, it's like, okay, so why should we have to, why should the truckers have to wait for Trudeau to smash them? And then you're on, and then you're on will be like, okay, I'm on the trucker's side. That's doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe. <laughs> well, he's yeah, maybe. maybe the Senate would stop him. So there's still, um, you know, division of government power. It's not quite authoritarian. Um, yeah, but that's different from being on the trucker side. He can be on the trucker side now. And then, you know, I, think if, he is. I, I don't think he's anti trucker. He's just saying the method is, is not as thuggish and they shouldn't do that, but he still wants, he respects the spirit of leave me alone, you know? So there's some nuance there. It's not like he's totally anti trucker a hundred percent. I know he tries to ride the fence, but I, I'm saying that he needs to pick a side. That's, Basically, my bottom line is pick a side already. I mean, it's just so frustrating to have these method critics arguing, nitpick, nitpicking the method when we're up against something like Trudeau, who Yaron admits is an authoritarian. Yeah, here's a, you're wrong. Here's a, persuaded go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, here's a quote from Churchill I just thought was very relevant to deciding when to take action. He says, if you will not fight for right when you can easily win without bloodshed, if you will not fight when your victory will be sure and not too costly, you may come to the moment when you will have to fight with all odds against you and only a precarious chance of survival. There may be an even worse fate. You may have to fight when there is no hope of victory because it is better to perish than to live as slaves. Yeah, I mean, that's a great quote. It, it indicates he lived the problem. It. Yeah, it indicates the real problem of being an appeaser, of appeasing evil, is that at some point, you're not going to be able to fight anymore because the evil will have too many people right. behind them. They'll be too strong. They'll have too much control over your life, and you will have no resources to fight. Are we getting stronger or weaker as things are going to authoritarianism? We're getting stronger. The objectivist movement is growing. I would like to see evidence of that in the real world in, with, in terms of actions, not just members. Yeah, but members leads to actions, right? So you can't reverse the order. So it take, it's, it's slow. Like everyone was talking about on the show, it's not this, there's no silver bullet. There's not gonna be any kind of impulsive, quick movements. So, oh, slowly. That doesn't mean do nothing. It's not do nothing. That, uh, Peacock says the truckers won't do everything, but they should still be backed. Yeah. Okay. So we we all all three of us agree on the truckers. Um, okay, but I'm I'm a quality over quantity guy. Both are important. You, you need you need a lot of people on your side. But what's probably more important is you need quality people who can go to the front line and inspire the truckers. Give them ideas give them methods, teach them things, relate to them, uh, you know, have an interaction and, and, and be on the right side of, of history. And so I think if, uh, if objectivism had more quality activists, intellectual activists, we would get further than if we just focused on subscriber counts and, um, you know, how many people were drawing to, uh, the OAC or things like that. We need to like focus on getting quality and just do it, making quality actions out in the world. Yeah, quality actions. Yeah. I, that I 
I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. And I think that's coming. I think uh, in the next five years, I can't imagine things getting much better. Um, maybe they'll get inflation under control. I don't, I'm moving out of New York. I can't. You cut out, Dave. What's that? You, you, <laughs> right after you said you're moving out of New York, you cut out. Oh, I just said my car got booted twice over. Uh, I was driving. They caught me on the red light cameras in the bus lane, sending me tickets. Uh, it just this, the city's broke. They're harassing. This what I pay in rent is ridiculous. I don't know how anyone lives in New York unless you're filthy rich. And, um, you know, things like that are going to annoy people. And, you know, cost of living is going to make people more uh, prone to violence or, you know, prone to some kind of uh, radical action. Let's not be spending the next five to 10 years telling these people not to do anything and just take it. And it's not time left. But let's start the process of preparing them for when things get do get bad and it'll actually be a beacon to attract people to the movement what do you mean prepare them like what are you saying like with ideas or with like hey this is how we're going to march through the streets i mean it can be a combination of things in case of the truckers uh you know it is action but it can also be what i was talking about before preparing people for uh tactics of the left how to steal yourself against it but you know, while you're sitting there saying that, oh, you know, the conservatives are going to do it wrong and make things worse. I mean, you, you, you can't give that message about preparing for the left. Um, well, could you do both? Couldn't you say, look, the left is really bad. They're really hostile. We have to fight it. But there's some issues with the conservative movement just to be aware of. Like that's Yaron always talks about people only. See He's not saying there's binary. issues to be aware of. He's saying that the left are nihilists and only the conservatives can lead us to the authoritarian, uh, you know, apocalypse that uh, has been <laughs> prophesized. Right. And I'm not saying he's wrong. He could very well be right on that. And I'm, you know, um, uh, and that's I'm saying he's wrong. OK, well, maybe we and, and even the, the dim hypothesis that he got it from the author of that thinks he's wrong. Well, it you does know, this, seem that way. This is um, the debate between um, whether you're focused on the future or whether you're focused on what's going on now. And I, I think if you focus too much on the future and uh, whether the right is going to take over, the left is going to take over. Um, you're, you're basically prophesying something. You're, you're, you're basically speculating. And you're, you're not in the now. You're not fighting yeah. things in the now. And to some extent, you need to strategize and project into the future. But at some other point, you need to come back to the now, reality, the present, and, fo and, and look at history, what happened in history, uh, the facts of history and and how you can apply what your knowledge of history to now and, and what needs to happen into the world of ideas right it's yeah a, it's a false alternative I mean, we, we will do both and i think there's going to be more civil disobedience as, as quality of life gets worse right but where is objectivism is is are they going to just be telling everyone not to do it I, I don't think it depends how bad it gets, you know. I think, and you know, your own again. He's also and got the gated community thing going on. He's kind of shielded from some of the hardship the common man is is going through, you know. But um, you're fair about your gated community jibes. <laughs> I mean, look, he's you know the guy. He's uh, you know owns a hedge fund. He's living in very fancy condos. You know, he's not feeling it like the working guy, the trucker. Well, yeah. I, I don't go that route because Yaron's li lived a whole life and he's he came up in Israel and in under war conditions. He was in war. I mean, I think he's got a grounding in, in reality and what the normal person goes through. He's just achieved some element of affluence and good for him. He's living comfortably. But my problem with him is that he's focused too much on fantasizing, speculating into the future. He said he lives in the future. I mean, that's basically a quote from one of his shows. He's a, he's a strategizer, a, you know, thinker, but 
what we need in the objectivist movement are people on the ground, people who are talking to the people on the ground, the movements, the protesters, the, the people who are forming coalitions and getting things done. I mean, that's what we need. One of the main truckers was quoting Stephen Hicks and uh, God Saad several times. So yeah. my prediction is the worse the standard of living gets, there's going to be more objectivist footwork on the ground. I think in the next five years, the movement's going to grow a lot. And I think there's going to be a big decrease in standard of living and thus more civil disobedience. Well, I don't see how it could go any other way. Um, well, at least we're ending on a positive note. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got like Ayn Rand UK, those are all young guys. You know, what's Nikos and Rucka and, uh, you know, there's a young... Yeah, you know, a lot of them lean left too. They don't lean left. I mean, we got to define lean left just because they don't agree if with If you Eagle want the Uber. Democrats to win, you lean left. I don't yeah. think we should go into this territory. Can we get back to uh, something Peacock said? Sure. Go ahead. Um, he's so the mandates for him represent, quote, perfect examples of the tentacles of totalitarianism. So he's ident he's associating the mandates with totalitarianism. So it's I want to I want to get to that point where we can see the tentacles. And, and identify them and list them and then see how large this monstrosity is. And that's kind of where I want to focus. Um, I don't think we can do it all in this show, but maybe have another show where we just examine the state of the dictatorship and, and where we're at in its progression. That could be a fascinating topic. Well, um, Dave, as always, uh, we're glad to get your perspective. It's good to see that you, um, you know, you argue fairly, but you're objective. And, uh, you know, we'll probably uh, have you back if we end up doing that show William was talking about. But uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Absolutely. It was fun. I love having these back and forths. Um, yeah, this is good. I'm looking forward to the edit and uh, uh, the having this posted. Great. William, any final thoughts? Um, no, just thank you, Dave, for joining us. It's always great to have an additional person to talk to. Um, and you do bring up excellent points and you make us think. So thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Well, this has been the Ayn Rand Fan Club. I'm Scott Schiff, along with William Swig, and we will see you next time.